Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, and as Martha said, I've been host of here 2017 to 19. And this is also sort of a continuation from my work that I've done during that time. So mainly we're now back to just addressing the computational question. And in particular, the question, how do you can reduce these unrolled uh, reconstruction methods for 3D data with non-trivial forward operators? So the column being transformed or what I'm actually most interested in was what I was in tomography, but similar problems. So this will be mostly on the computational side. So if you're wondering where all of this, so here we have a nice map from our set of accidents uh, in this problems. So you see actually all Finland is quite active in various problems. And I'm here, this small dot in the lower, uh, working on my computational problems. Good. So from there, let's set the stage. So this will be a bit repetitive from the last talks, but I need my uh, my own viewpoint here. So we are interested in the classic English problem. We want to find an unknown, perhaps a measurement, and most importantly, we have knowledge of our forward operator here that maps between the image and the data space. And then, given our measurement data, well, classically, we have some reconstruction algorithm, we plug in our data, and we get something that is hopefully close to our uh, ground truth. So the whole paradigm now, what I uh, call it, Learned reconstructionists, we want to parameterize this mapping one way or the other. If it's just one parameter, so a regularization parameter, or a whole bunch of parameters for in an unbroad uh, architecture. So the same paradigm, of course, applies. We want to find an optimal set of parameters such that we get a reconstruction that is close to our uh, ground truth. Good. So the classic, how one could say this all started is the two-step approach it's pretty simple we just we know we have a reconstruction operator we have all data given here then we apply our reconstruction operator which here would be the different back projection we get quite a bad reconstruction from low dose ct data or those under sampled and then we just train a large convolutional network on top of this to clean up the data and we've actually seen this already how this Network looks like typically a very popular architecture, the so called UNET. Um, this was quite an influential paper that investigated this. But here again, we have our filter back projection. We train a very large neural network on this to remove the artifacts to give us a clean image. And here, the important point is this is trained, fully supervised, so we need to know a reference uh, reconstruction that we want to achieve, which here is. Just fully sampled high loss CT data, and we want to reconstruct from sub sampled data or low dose data the same quality image as we must get from a high dose scan. Um, so, but as I said, one what's important for us that we have our forward operator in here, there's not much forward operator happening here, so it's just there, and then it's a lot of training. And so we would like to add a bit more knowledge back from our physics. And that's where these unrolled schemes come into the play, what I call model-based iterative reconstruction, because well, we use our model explicitly in the learning framework. But here in my, my formulation, we have now one what I call an updating operator or an updating network that takes in the gradient of the data fidelity and um, for an iterate to produce a new iterate. So the schematic here again, we start from some measurement data cytogram. We take an initial reconstruction by applying the adjoint here. So not the good effect, of course, you could also use the good effect projection here. We just need some initial reconstruction, and then we compute the gradient of the data fidelity. And the nice part here, the gradient of the data fidelity tells us in which direction do we need to improve our image to get a better reconstruction. And that's very important information that we can feed into the neural network. So if we now take these two ingredients, feed that into the neural network, then we can get the next update and we repeat this the number of times to then get the nice reconstruction back. So we also have seen that a very famous or also popular um, architecture that is very hard to beat 
in this framework is a so called learn final rule. Here it's going even one step further. We don't only work on the image space, so we've been the slide before, we only work on the image space on the networks. Here the networks also work in the data space. So we have a small network in the data space. Then we do a forward projection to the image space, have a small network there, and we iterate in between image and data space back and forth. So this is, as everyone who's worked with this, this network architecture is very hard to beat if you can trade. That's the big problem. And as we all of this started, so also actually Jonas Adler, he's been part of these projects uh, that we requested. How can we actually use this architecture because it works so nicely? But they were only able to train it in 2D. How could we do something in 3D? We actually, in my slides, I didn't get quite there. Currently, we're wiping up something, but it didn't make it to the top. So, the biggest problem here is this architecture needs to be trained end to end. And end to end means we need to have knowledge of the input here, and we need to propagate through this whole thing to the reconstruction operator. And to train this, we need to have the full knowledge of the forward and backward possible. And that is a problem. So let's go a few steps back again. We are now interested in only gradient schemes. So again, the motivation comes from the classic variation framework. We have data fidelity, we have the regularization term, and well, the really simplest way to solve this, in my opinion, is gradient descent, we just a classic gradient descent. Where we have one step length, we take the gradient of the data fidelity and we have the gradient of the regularizing. So now the whole idea of these learned gradient schemes is well, we take these ingredients, we have the current difference, we have the gradient of the data fidelity, we plug that into the neural network to give us an update. And as you might have noticed, the regularizer disappeared. So the whole premise here in this approach is that this updating operator or how the network learns the regularizer or so called the, the prior uh, from the training board. Oh. Uh, okay, that's very good. Let's go back. Okay, good. So, and in the unrolled way, then we define this set of reconstruction networks or updating networks that give us then our unrolled. Uh, Learn to scheme of a set amount of variables. An important part here is again our reconstruct or parameterized reconstruction operator is we plug in the data and we get the final reconstruction after any steps. So back to the training procedure. Ideally, we would like to train this end to end. So given supervised data, so we have measurement data and ground truth data. We do empirical risk minimization with loss function, which is here the L2 distance, given our reconstruction operator and the ground truth images. Ideally, we would like to minimize this. One problem is, well, as you saw, the, or the forward operator is actually included in here. And it's not only in the forward pass, but we repeatedly use our forward operator. It's also in the back propagation, we use the same. We need to evaluate again our forward operator or the joint multiple times. So it becomes pretty expensive in 2D. We can still manage it. If we move to 3D, this becomes pretty prohibitive. And there's another issue. So if we want to train this end to end, on top, there might be also, if we actually are interested in relevant three dimensional uh, volume sizes. Even the memory consumption becomes a problem for convolutional networks because uh, so convolutional networks work the way that they make copies of the image and save them all in the memory. And as I said, the bigger problem, that's the more conceptual problem, the forward operator just takes time. So let's address first the memory problem. Actually, that uh, is not, not a limiting factor here. So there's some easier way. Actually, one of the pretty much early approaches for to get around all of this memory consumption is so-called gradient checkpointing. So how the back propagation actually works is that you need to save the intermediate states, and then the back propagation the saved states are used to efficiently calculate the backward pass. This 
could be overcome by having checkpoints, and from the checkpoint, you then calculate backwards. This makes the training a bit slower, so it's a trade off between training time and memory consumption. So you could get around a bit of memory problem like that. Another nice, uh, nice uh, more methodological approach is using invertible neural networks where you don't need to save your intermediate states, you can directly go to the backward pass. And as we saw, what it actually, but the only drawback maybe here is that we restrict again the expressivity of our network, so it might perform a bit worse. But actually, in this nice paper, it was shown that for large volume sizes, it actually performs better because it can perform the back propagation more efficiently. <laughs> so, compared to full radio, uh, compared to the full back propagation through a large memory consuming network. And what third one is, if you have enough money, just buy more GPUs. Uh, sadly, most in academia, we don't have that option. So that's why we need to do some research on the methodology of such things. Good. So, but back to the actual more conceptual problem. What do we do if our forward operator is expensive? The first way that we actually got around with it is, well, do we need to use the forward operator in the training procedure? Maybe not, not really necessarily. So instead of training it end-to-end, -end, what we did first is we um, investigated the so-called, what, what we call the greedy approach. So what does that mean? Instead of now, um, requiring here the end-to-end -end optimality, what we require is an iterative-wise optimality. So now we are given, actually, we have our xi fixed, so we have a current iterate fixed. We can compute the gradient of the data fidelity now for our current iterate, and then train the network to get as close as possible to the ground truth for this given state. And when this network is trained, We'll evaluate the forward pass for this one step. We get the next xi, xi plus one. And for that, we can compute again the gradient for the whole training set, fix that because that doesn't change anymore, and then train the next step uh, to get as close as possible to the ground truth. So that's what we call the greedy approach. And each step, we go as far as possible as we can given our current state. From an, optim uh, from an optimization point of view, well, this gives us an upper bound on the optimality, but in practice, actually, it performs rather well. So, um, so in practice, as I said, we were mostly that time interested in photo acoustic tomography, and now you actually see the real problem here is for relatively small image sizes, the forward operator takes about 12 seconds. And we train five iterates, which each has the forward operator and the adjoint. So that's about two and a half minutes um, for the forward pass if we train five iterates. So it's pretty slow and it becomes very prohibitive if you want to train that end to end for about 20,000 iterations. My rough calculation gave me 140 days, uh, which I really do not want to wait for my results. Um, for results, actually, Look quite nice. So again, we do the same here. We have fully sampled reference data. So this is actually a 3D reconstruction from a human palm. So you see here the, the vessels. Um, and this is, so this would be then a reconstruction from subsampled data. And here, you see, we actually only check 20 iterations of total variation as a reference. And here we have our uh, reconstruction, which does quantitatively nice. Uh, relatively also good, um, so at least at least the practitioners like this. Um, but you see, still a problem. Well, ah, still two and a half minutes for reconstruction. So now we have an unrolled reconstruction we managed to get from down from 10 minutes to two and a half minutes. Not exactly what we were planning for, we want to be a bit faster. So we kept thinking. Um, but the greedy got worked, but Downside is, well, we have some of the parameters, but in principle, they're a bit enough. It gets a bit tedious to train, but that's not really prohibitive. But the biggest problem is it's still just slow to evaluate. It's just limited still by the evaluation of your forward operator. So, can we do some principled way to speed this up? Doesn't need to be full acoustics, but general for any applications. 
So it's a way to utilize an end to end training for large scale problems and speed up the reconstructions to overcome these limitations. And what we came up with after a while is why don't we compute all of the interests on a full resolution? We could just compute some of them on a smaller resolution to do first get rid of the, some of these freaking artifacts and um, CG, and then get the high frequency components while we go in the interest. So that's what we then investigate more. For that, we need a bit rotation. So we then, as we have our multi-scale approach, we can reconstruct on different discretizations. So what we introduce uh, are discretization spaces from the coarsest to the uh, to the finest uh, discretization space. And here we chose them exactly to coincide with the interest of our unrolled reconstruction. So then, of course, on each of these discretization space, we have a reconstructed image and the corresponding data. And as I said, the final then the uh, discretization space corresponds to our reconstruction uh, that we want to have. Then if we formulate the, the, the inverse problems nice and via infinite dimensions, what we can do is we can just get our corresponding forward and the joint operators uh, discretized on the corresponding discretization space. So that's actually quite nice. And we also reformulated that the data lives in our finite infinite dimensional space. We assume it's there, and we can just every time project it down to our discretization space uh, corresponding to the current difference. In practice, of course, this will be just the finest, <laughs> the finest uh, or the, the data that we, that we measure. So this will be the finest discretization space actually in practice. Um, and of course, we need not something operator that goes between the address. Can we learn or not? So in our case, we just fixed it to investigate uh, mostly how the premise of this model scale of works. So then, the learn gradient scheme pretty straightforward terms into a multi scale learn gradient scheme. We still compute our gradient on the current our current discretization space, and then. We, we have our updating operator on the current discretization space. And then after the update is performed, we upsample. And then, so here we have the, uh, the schematic. So the same, so we're starting on our courses level. We compute the gradient on the courses level. We put it into the convolutional network or updating network to get um, next, to get actually, so now that the, the actually the indexing changes a bit because this is actually our next iterate, but it's still on the discretization space for the first for the course level. So then we just update the, the index when we go to the next discretization space. So that, that was a rotational choice. And then we repeat this until we end up at the finest resolution. Unfortunately, we noticed. Well, this, this works quite nicely. Unfortunately, we noticed that we lose, in fact, due to the upsampling, a few of the high frequency components, which, uh, in terms of quantitative results, was not uh, desired. So, what we then used on top of just computing the gradient of the back projection, we actually also computed what we call the filtered gradient, where we used the filtered back projection to retain some of the high frequency components in the gradient formation. So then we here, instead of a joint, we use the filter back projection and we use not a family for the updates. So we have the current inverse, we have the gradient of the ability plus the filter gradient, which has more high frequency information. And that worked quite nicely. Yeah? So then we then, well, it's quite straightforward to turn this multi-scale uh, gradient scheme into the filtered version by replacing this one by the family of updates. Good. So, in terms of application, we applied this to a nice uh, data set from CWI in the Netherlands. They spent 42 walnuts in 512 cubes size. 
a total of 1,200 angles, high doors, uh, and three scanning positions. So if you then combine the three scanning positions to a variation reconstruction, you can eliminate the uh, cone beam artifacts and get a nice ground growth data. And so that's what we used as our ground growth. So we used the, the reconstruction from the three scanning positions. And then what we did again, so we now investigated the problem, can we get from subsample data the same reconstruction quality? Unfopportunately, we were limited to our GPU size at this point, so we only managed to get up to 168 cubed. Um, that was a bit unfortunate. We would have liked to get a bit higher. Um, but anyway, it did draw me. Good. Then further on, um, in the quest of beating the uh, quantitative values. We combine our multi scale approach. So now, here on the left, you actually see this is our uh, multi scale reconstruction. Um, we combine that with the unit architecture because the unit architecture nicely coincides to the same multi scale uh, decomposition. We think about this the finest scale, and then you have coarser scales. So, what we now do here is we follow the multi scale learned gradient scheme. We compute it here, but we keep the intermediate states that we have and we feed it into the respective uh, scales of the unit architecture to reuse the information that we have in the previous iterates. And then at the end, this is fed through the classic unit architecture to produce our final reconstruction. And as you notice, also here, we, we use this slightly smaller channel size than in a classic unit architecture, partly due to GPU, also partly because we don't want to have this high capacity network that then produces also a lot of fire again. Good, so for that, um, yes, we trained this whole thing. Now we were able to train it in 10,000 iterations only for in 10 hours with the model in there, so model uh, based Iterative reconstruction end to end in 3D in 10 hours. I probably would nowadays iterate a bit longer, but it, uh, it gave us nice results already at that time. Classic, we minimized again the LG distance and we used 40 walnuts here for training, one for validation, and one for test. <laughs> but there's not much left after that. Um, good. Let's have a look at the results. It's sort of a classic. Um, so we have here our uh, round group phantom down sampled from the 512 cube down sampled 168, so the matrix resolution. The well, classic FDK reconstruction unit does a pretty good job as always, so gives us really nice reconstruction. The multi scale learn gradient scheme, um, that's actually worse, which is unfortunate, but I mean. In terms of quantitative values, it does worse. Uh, qualitatively, it's very hard to find any differences in these images. And the D unit, uh, our hybrid D unit, improves a tiny bit on this in terms of quantitative values, but again, qualitatively, pretty much similar. So you might at this point wonder why over above all of this. Okay, well, this is a whole bunch. Um, good. So let's have a short fly through the data because we can do it. Not that we really see much here, but, but it's nice to see the FDK. We nicely see the on beam artifacts here, which then are nicely moved, and we get rid of the noise and we get nice reconstruction. Good. So let's have a look at our quantitative values now. In terms of what well, here's nice as M, this hybrid network does pretty well. Training time is quite competitive. So here actually we managed to get it lower than what I reported a few slides back. Execution time is still under a second, which is pretty nice for 3D reconstruction. Parameter wise, we also will be a bit slower than a full unit that we have, but it's on the large side. In terms of memory, so these are only the forward pass memory needed. So for if you do the back propagation, you need to double it. Our estimate what we would need for a learned gradient scheme, so a full unrolled gradient scheme um, to train that, but we didn't. It would have taken 
a lot longer. It still takes to not second to reconstruct and more of course. Nowadays, what we need to do is just more. Um, this is not a problem, but of course, the larger your data, uh, the larger the GPU you get, or the larger your data gets, so you never really catch up if you don't improve on the methodology. So, still, why do we bother with all of this model based stuff? So, there are a few other empirical studies that show that these model based unrolled reconstructions are much more robust in terms of the well, shift in your data distribution uh, when we evaluate, and on also in particular in terms of geometry in your acquisition geometry. Because it is encoded in the model, so you have it, you have it explicitly in the reconstruction, in the unrolled reconstruction, encoded in the model. So you don't need to learn it from the network, or the network doesn't need to learn it from the data because you have it in there. So that's that helps a lot, um, and that's actually what the gradient of the data fidelity tells us. And with respect to the chosen geometry, this is where we need to improve. And we can use smaller networks that might carry less bias. And now, case okay, so what we tested is so we, we started from the actual measurement data and we artificially increased the noise level. And what we see, well, they're all fairly stable actually, up to 10% noise, which so is pretty amazing. But you see that unit then really has a sharp drop off after a while, whereas all of these model based approaches stay fairly. Uh, uh, constant in reconstruction quality. So that's quite nice. And this is also a nice paper that I could recommend on this topic, which investigates exactly this issue on robustness of the reconstruction and also model-based approaches. Good, final uh, topic here, because I claim it's more scalable. A few disclaimers in there, of course. So here we are on 2D uh, because then we can scale a bit higher. We just had the this on 2D uh, fan beam geometry. And so we computed how much memory do we consume. And the problem is, well, because the memory is governed by the size of the image. So sadly, we can only we can only shift the constant, we can't really shift um, the, the order of the memory consumption. The so full scale unit, so there's no full scale unit, we use a lot. The learn gradient schemes also actually if you unroll them all, we use quite a lot. And this multi scale approach just cut it down a bit. So the memory, as I said, we all sadly in the order of the image dimensions, so we can't really do anything. But what we also approach here is the order of the operator evaluations, which was actually our main goal, because the operator is so expensive. So now we managed to get it down from the number of iterates to the border of just one iterate. So we need to join and the forward as well. Good. So the take home message is we can reduce memory consumption of learned iterative schemes, make it end to end trainable if we don't require all iterates to be on the final resolution. And then uh, we get faster, more robust reconstructions by doing that. Another line of research that I'm interested in this, especially in the photo acoustic case, is where we can use cheaper models, so approximate models. So then on top of having a multi-scale approach, so you could also think this is an approximate model, but you could also use, if available, an approximate model on the finest scale. And then you can really cut down the computation times. But that's so when you talk about introducing noise in the training data, you talk about variational noise as in the paper you mentioned, or what or is it noise coming from the you know um, low density? So what we wanted to do, so we applied, so we evaluated everything on the real measurement data. We didn't want to add any additional noise there. Um, so we also trained on the measurement data with the noise level it has. And for the testing, when we investigated the robustness, we just added um, 
Gaussian noise on the cytochromes. So just to test robustness with respect to additional noise in the measurement data. Yeah, uh, how do you scale? How do you uh, scale the size? Uh, how do you decide the size for for this for this scale? Ah, uh, you mean you mean the uh, the resolution? Yes. Oh, it's basically I'm going to set the factor of two here. But you follow up to what's the scale for? So we have 168 and the highest. But you ask why we have 168 cubed. Uh, that's what we fitted into the GQ. Okay. That's a simple answer. <laughs> Sorry, that's very trivial. Yeah. Okay. Again, on this uh, multi scale approach, you say at some point you upsample. So, is it a deterministic of something? That's undeterministic. Yes. Okay. So, you yes. have only looked at. We could learn learn. 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 Yes, oh, of course, we could. Um, here, we wanted to see just basically, we wanted to have. We could have just learned it as well, but um, <laughs> we wanted to we wanted to investigate how the paradigm works for how introducing more and more learning those other papers. So with CT, you when well, the way CT works, you kind of have uh, uh, more data in the low frequencies than you have in the high frequencies anyway. So if you do your multi-scale approach, can't you just fully reconstruct the low scales anyway, do a high quality, and then just Try to approximate the high frequencies. So yes, so for the for lower scales, yes. Um, but you mean no, the there's, a, there's a scale of so you lose, yes. you know, the higher. Yes. yes. So yeah, you would need to approximate when okay. you move to the next scale. If you have a better estimate of the low frequencies. Yes. But the, the, you know, yes. there's it's a higher frequency. You, you really need to estimate because that's where you have most of the noise. That's where you have some energy for common mm -hmm. If you actually do that more, they have to more clever than what we did. We just I can't even remember what we did. It was not very sophisticated. I mean, I think that partly depends on how sparse view sampling you have, right? If it's very sparse, even your low frequencies. For DC, that, right? for DC, you just need one projection. Okay, it's a scaling, but, you know. So I'm intrigued by the the fact you replace the adjoint with filter back projection basically in there. Yes. I think that's a interesting idea that I haven't seen. I'm curious if you've seen anybody else do that. It to, was, I actually okay. got a comment on that. Uh, I see, but okay. Some, some group that did that. Uh, I need to find out the reference again. Okay. Yes, uh, I think we, we then also put the reference into the paper. So we have, I can forward that. Yeah, because then it sort of becomes a learned iterative filter back projection approach, basically, right? Uh, kind of, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's... Unfortunately, it just becomes a bit more expensive. But yeah, we really yeah, saw a yeah, huge yeah. improvement in the in the quality. But maybe with a better up something, we could also overcome yeah. that. Hi. Yep. This is just one related to this question. So I think Martin Kensel used it in the AAB and CP challenge. Yeah. The yes. same thing. Yes. Uh, I'm replacing a joint. Oh, I did. I did. Oh, okay. okay. So I was actually not aware of that. Okay. Yes. We all do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I think um, uh, using the filter back projection set of the joint time corresponds to precondition. Yeah. yeah. And so I have um, some sort of conceptual question. So to me, uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, it seems that the the learned part of the of, of your construction method in terms of complexity of the training and number of training parameters is governed by this unit here, yeah, right? This last one. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, at least in terms of well, the parameters. Yes. Yeah. So, given the fact that you use this uh, at the beginning set of the joint, uh, couldn't you then uh, do something like um, use a few iterations? Um, Here, uh, this iteration space. Or okay. So, uh, 
it's, yeah, it's difficult to pose the question. So the, the fact that you uh, propose this multi-scale approach somehow arises from the fact that you want to use an iterative scheme. Yes. Right? Yeah. But couldn't you, for example, just, uh, I don't know, generate one single uh, image? X, let's call it XCNN, so which is a uh, noise free image, so to speak, and then include this, uh, for example, in a TikTok regularization, and then iterate, a, I don't know, perform a few iterations um, using this FPP. Uh, so, because I, I would assume that using uh, this filter back projection instead of the joint, you could do, I don't know, maybe four or six iterations. And then already get close to solution. So instead of putting effort onto this, this multi scale approach, you put all the effort in one network, which gives you some problems, and then use this as a regularization term. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. clear what I mean. <laughs> um, not fully, but <laughs> let me put you get right this down. Yeah. But if I understand correctly, you want to do a few iterations on the finest scale. That's what we're trying to do. The fact that we use the preconditions somewhere. But we want to really limit as much as possible on the final scale because that, that governs our computational cost. Yeah. That was our. Exactly. So that's why I mean, do you expect that, I don't know, for example, using four uh, iterations or so would be much heavier than uh, this? Or I don't know. It would be slower. Yes. So here you need to think in three that you have a factor of eight in computational cost when you start sample by a factor of two. So it really scales. It, it, it's, it's completely governed by the finest scale, the computational cost. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What kind of resolutions are you hoping for in photoacoustics market? Because 168 cubed isn't going to do it in metrics. No, no, right? No. So. And for the acoustics, we actually have the most uh, the size that we are oh, yeah, yeah. at the beginning 240 times 240 times 80. Uh -huh. uh, yes, in CT, you would like to, or CBCG to 1000 cubes, ideally. Um, yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> um, right. a few steps. <laughs> So uh, have you tried or, or thought instead of um, having um, region of interest at full resolution and, and touch the entire the entire field of view with, with that? We actually, so we thought about it. And the problem is, yeah, you would need to, because so this, and the combing transform is, uh, if it's global in that sense. So we didn't really figure out that good way to patch it. That was the... I have a paper on this, on this oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, we might figure one out soon. Uh, uh, there is actually something. Yes. All oh, right. Ah, oh, okay. The reference on the on the adjoint, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I read the paper carefully. I don't know. 